The cost of a higher education is continuing to climb and becoming cost prohibitive to many. What can the federal government do to address tuition hikes and or student loan costs? All right. Well, that's an extremely important question. As a mother of a 25, 22-year-old, 19-year-old, I'm well aware of just how, how difficult that is for many families. Um, when I was all over the district asking people what was going on in their lives, uh, finding out what their top concerns were this summer, the, one of the top three issues was education and the affordability of higher edu education. In this country, we believe strongly that education is the key to good jobs, to a middle class life. We tell our kids, work hard, study at school, go, you know, go on and get an advanced degree and you'll have a great job. But that's getting out of reach for too many American families. It's one of the reasons I worked so hard uh, summer before last because unfortunately the Tea Party uh, allowed interest rates to double on student loans. That was costing thousands of dollars for folks in Connecticut. Um, we were able to undo that and drop the interest rates in half. I'm co-sponsor of a bill that would allow private, private industry student loans to be renegotiated, to be at a lower rate, to again, we want to encourage people to stay in school. We want to encourage our young people to finish their degrees and then to, to raise their families here. And if it becomes out of reach, that's a problem for all of us. And, I, and frankly, I think it's important that we understand there's a linkage too. We're going to see problems in the housing market because now, right now young people are so burdened by student loans, they're not buying houses. And, and that's going to have an impact across the construction industry. It's going to have an impact around the state. We're beginning to see it already. So again, this needs to be a bipartisan solution, working together to find ways to keep those rates lower and to work with our universities to bring those tuitions down. Okay, Mr. Greenberg, your response? Yeah, You're uh, a little behind on the time, so feel free to expand. We have a great aerospace industry in this state. We always talk about companies leaving the state, but I'm gonna to talk tonight about the fact that we have tremendous machinists, technicians, skilled workers in companies like Admill in New Britain that just won a large contract for Pratt, with Pratt & Whitney. I'm going to say something which may be a little bit controversial. I not think that every, that every person should go to liberal arts school. I think perhaps we should have some of our young people going to vocational school, going to learn the skills that Admill Corp uh, need in their people. Admill Corp needs people to work in New Britain at the cleanest possible manufacturing facility that I've seen. I've seen a lot of manufacturing facilities, a lot of them are clean. We have an, an opportunity in this state to bring back manufacturing, to, to make these, these aerospace parts, these Pratt & Whitney engines, um, the greatest in the, country, in, the, in the world. So maybe what we should do is encourage some folks, some young kids, some young adults, to go to vocational schools to fill these jobs. These jobs are roughing $25 per hour starting out. These employers are willing to pay for the education at these vocational schools for these folks. So maybe we should change our, our outlook again. Let's become a manufacturing giant again in Connecticut. Now, in terms of the student rate uh, interest rates, we're charging 65 to 7% for those loans. I think that's crazy, frankly, because the government borrows uh, at a much lower rate. I think that the government should reduce those rates. I think they should. They have to make the burden of these loans for these people, these young children coming out of a school, a little easier. And by the way, young people are not coming back to Connecticut. I think eight or nine out of ten young people graduating are not coming back to Connecticut or leaving Connecticut to find jobs elsewhere. Let's work on making this state great again. I like to say that from 1991 to 2014, we've gone from first to worst. Let's make the next 20 years from worst to first again, and let's do it by making sure that we, we, we deal with the skills that we have, the tremendous labor force that has skills that unfortunately are growing older among our population. Let's let younger people learn these skills so we can be great again in this state. Thank you. Anything more to add on this issue? Please do. Yes. I'm a third generation manufacturer. My father and grandfather were civil engineers and started a little manufacturing company that's been going for 64 years, doing zinc die casting. 
They fought off competition from Mexico, from Korea, now China. Manufacturing built this country, it built this state. But it shouldn't just be a part of our past, it is a part of our future. That's why I've been working so hard in a bipartisan way, and I, I will assure you there's a lot of bipartisan support in Congress for these initiatives. Just last, just two weeks ago, I introduced a bill with a re Republican from the Rochester area in New York for manufacturing universities to support programs at places like UConn and our engineering school to have our best and brightest engineers go into manufacturing right here in America. That's why I worked so hard to help get the $1.7 million grant for Naukatuck Valley Community College, which has a great program in manufacturing, both in Waterbury and in Danbury, and that federal grant is going to be going to work for our children and for retrained workers to have the skill sets we need to be competitive in the 21st century. We need to make things in America. There's innovation that comes from making things, and I know that, we all know that, but we need to stand up for and level the playing field for American workers, and we need to be working on things like STEM education, that science, technology, engineering, and math, which I've made a focal point of my efforts on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. We'll never be able to have middle class jobs again if we aren't ensuring that every child in this state has terrific technical skills. Those are the high paid jobs. Those are the jobs we want and they can't get them if they don't have those skills and that's why we need to work on them. With our technical high schools, our community colleges, and for those who wish to, on to advanced degrees. We need all of it and it should all be world class. Okay, Mr. Greenberg, anything more to add? No, thank you. No, not at all, all right. The next question goes to you from Ms. Lee. Thank you. ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, announced recently that it will seek to impose Sharia law across the world. Driven by ideology based on brutality and extremism, ISIL's steady growth threatens us all. In your opinion, how should the United States deal not only with the de deterring the brutal violence that ISIL spreads, but also the proliferation of its ideology? Test for me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, I was on a radio interview and I warned of these folks, they call themselves ISIL, ISIS, ICE, whatever you call them, uh, radical fundamentalist Islamists who are out to kill us. Let's be very clear about that. Their ideology has um, determined that essentially anybody who doesn't think the way they do needs to be taken over, die, essentially. I warned about it and I was ridiculed for warning about that. I think I was ahead of my time, frankly, in terms of that. These people are out to kill us. They've said that they want to raise the flag on the White House. I think to a large extent that we're dealing with a problem that shouldn't have been the problem had we acted properly two years ago. Had we not created a vacuum by evacuating out of, out of uh, Iraq which we did in announcing the time that we'd be evacuating. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum, and ISIS moved into that vacuum. Now what we have to do is we have to stop these people. We have to stop them through whatever means are possible. I've agreed that the raids are good, the airstrikes, but as we know by history, when uh, Nazi Germany was attacking Great Britain, airstrikes alone did not allow them to win. Britain kept on being strong. So I have my doubts as to whether airstrikes alone will work. Secondly, we should try to arm those people in the way of the harm of these people in Syria, Iraq, and try to make them uh, save their own country uh, because they're there. Now, a, a bulwark to that will be Israel. Israel will not allow this to occur, to go beyond their borders. But we have to make sure that we look upon this as essentially an attack, an eventual attack on this country. 9-11 was an attack on this country. 9-11 spurred us to action. So we have to make sure that we try to prevent that in advance, that we try to prevent it from happening. And we have to do whatever we can to prevent that from happening. We also have to secure our borders because right now our borders are porous. 
So these folks could be crossing over the border and uh, developing their own terrorist networks right now in this country as we speak. All right, Ms. Esti, your response? ISIS poses a national security threat to America, and it poses a threat of chaos to the world. I am supportive of the President's current policies for airstrikes in both Iraq and Syria, because we do need to degrade the military capability of ISIS. But let me also be clear, I do not support the arming and the training of Syrian moderates. I voted against that request from the President. And I did so because our experience has not been good with those efforts. There were many classified briefings and a lot of discussion about who are these Syrian moderates? Are there any left? Are there actual aims to help support putting down ISIS? Or is there aim to overthrow Assad? We are a country that has endured 13 years of war, of bloodshed, of treasure in Iraq and in the region. I have a niece who served in Kabul and thank God came back safe a year and a half ago. But I am very wary of looking at putting young American men and women back in arms way unless we have a clearly achievable military objective. I think the U U.S. Congress needs to debate and vote on a new authorization for the use of military force. The Constitution empowers Congress and Congress alone to declare war. And it is unfair to our troops for this president or any president to commit combat troops to war without the voice of the American people, without your voice. It is your voice, and that is why Congress alone is supposed to debate and vote on these things. And I will say, for 40 or 50 years, Congress has been not exercising its constitutional responsibilities here, and it needs to. And I will continue to argue that we should have it in it. This is, this is a profoundly important decision that should be made with your voices at that table. Um, I, and, well, I will leave it there for now. I suspect well, there's more. Uh, Mr. Greenberg, feel yeah. free to expand. You yeah, I, I, I would, frankly, because, uh, frankly, in the last two years, it was a Democratic administration, and it was uh, Barack Obama, Harry Reid, Nancy Pelosi, and, and other members of Congress that allowed this to happen. We should have not allowed this to come to this point in time. Now we're in a position of fixing what that administration failed at. Anything else on this topic? Ms. Leaf, did you want any? I do follow have questions. one follow-up question that I would love for both candidates to answer. Both of you have replied with aspects with trying the violence with the violence, but my question really wants to deal with how do you deal with an ideology that as soon as you kill a member from ISIS, they already have 15 children ready to take up that gun. So as, as a leader, how do you combat the ideology, not so much the violence? Mm -hmm. Let's start with Mr. Greenberg. Yes, Mr. That, you know, that's an incredibly great question, and uh, I'm going to answer it in a uh, fashion that some people here may not want to hear. We are in this country reproducing at a rate of 1.6 per couple. We need 2.2, 2.3 to sustain. The, some of those folks that are out to kill us are reproducing at a rate of 5 or 6 to 1. And it doesn't seem that... We can do anything, in my opinion, to change their ideology. I wish we could get to them, get them to our table and say, you know, we all got to love each other. Let's love each other. But I don't think that's possible, frankly. So I think that their deeply rooted ideology prevents them, in many ways, from being peaceful with us. Okay, Ms. Esther, do you have a response? Um, I do. I, I take a very different perspective on this. I think we need the countries in the region to step up because you can't have the kind of freedom that we have in this country that we aspire for for other people around the world without rule of law, without respect for religious differences. Those are essential elements and those cannot be imposed by American military might, strong as our might is militarily. It cannot impose that on other countries, but what we can do is we can provide support, 
and we can spy, provide support for those groups within these countries and to encourage allies and partners in the region to model that respectful behavior which could foster and allow over time those countries to create the sort of societies that would not, would have opportunity for young people, particularly for young men, that would share in those opportunities and not make this way of violence so attractive. So again, there are limits to our military power, but I have great faith in the aspiration of all people towards dignity and freedom, and we should be working to foster that, but realistic, be realistic about what we can do from here and about the risks to us of putting our people in harm's way in a chaotic part of the world. Mr. Greenberg, I think you have something else yeah, to I say. Yeah, I do. Uh, Please do. That's you know, the Congresswoman idea. Congresswoman Esty, as you know, I identify myself as Jewish. So I, uh, I have a particular understanding about Israel, and I have read the Hamas Charter. And that Hamas Charter says that we will kill every Jew. And they have not changed that charter. So it seems to me in that region we have to have uh, Hamas, the Gazans, to revoke this charter before we really talk to them about being good neighbors. All right. Is there anything more on that topic? Or well, if we're are we discussing if we're discussing Israel, I'll, I'll certainly turn to that at this time. Um, I'm a very strong supporter of Israel. Have worked extensively on these issues. Every country has a right to defend itself. And no country and no people should be using human shields. It's wrong, and Hamas has done that. And brought trouble on itself for engaging in behavior which should be condemned by the international community. And Hamas's charter indeed does not recognize the right of Israel. And that is not to be supported. One of the concerns I have in our present debate as a country is that we are taking our eyes off of Iran. Iran, a nuclear weaponed Iran, is a danger to the United States, is a danger to Israel, and is a danger to world security. And with the current discussion and focus on Syria and Iraq, I am deeply concerned that we are not discussing what we should be, which is the fact that Iran is not complying with the timetable they agreed upon. And I have raised this repeatedly and will continue to do so. It is a dangerous world out there. And we need to use our power wisely. And we need to be attentive to all the different forms of what American security really means. And Iran is another one that we have to deal with and hold them accountable. Mr. Greenberg, since we expanded the question, do you have other things to say? This is your forum. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely with the Congresswoman regarding Iran. It's a very dangerous uh, country, so we're in full agreement on that. Okay, so we're ready to move on. Um, let's see, Mr. Reiser, you have a question for Ms. Esty? Yes, please, thank you. Uh, Robert F. Uh, Kennedy Jr. told a crowd not long ago here in Danbury that there's enough sun and wind, uh, enough sun and wind power in the United States um, to, to power the United States completely uh, and reduce the problems associated with coal, oil, nuclear energy if we would only invest in updating our national grid the same way we invested in our national highway system and that the cost of energy would subsequently drop and efficiency would increase similar to what we have seen happen to information on the internet. Uh, what, are, what are your plans to promote uh, clean energies? Well, my very first bill that I introduced in Congress was a clean energy bill. It's been signed by the President of the United States for the town of Collinsville to allow them to repurpose a 100-year-old dam and pr to produce clean power right here and power 1,500 homes. And I think we need to be creative. Some of that is repurposing, and for us in Connecticut, uh, frankly, that water power, I think can be part of reducing our reliance on the grid, and that is going to be important. It, this is an issue I'm a member, as a member of the Science Committee. We've spent a lot of time on the Research and Technology Subcommittee. I think we need to be looking at lots of different options, certainly over the short term. Uh, efficiency plays an important role, and one of those ways of doing that is the grid. That is not the only way of doing it, though. I, I think it would be um, inaccurate. I don't quite agree with his optimistic assessment that the national grid will solve all those problems. Uh, clearly natural gas is going to be a bridge fuel. One of the reasons we are seeing 
a renaissance of American manufacturing is because our energy prices are coming down. And prices in China are going up, prices in Germany are going up, and so we need to understand that our energy policies are actually intimately related to our economy. And, and so again, I want a clean energy future. Part of that is basic R&D, which I'm advocating for strongly. But we also need to be wary about the government picking particular winners and losers. I think it's better to set standards for efficiency, better set standards for meeting certain targets, and then let the market do its work to achieve that. Okay, Mr. Greenberg. Yeah, first, I would like to commend Congresswoman Estes' husband, Dan Estes, who was the commissioner of DEEP for a couple of years, uh, in promoting clean energy, among which is solar. I think he did a great job. And by the way, I took advantage of a program that he initiated, which relates to solar energy. And I installed a complete solar grid on one of my properties in Middletown through this terrific plan that Dan Esty engineered. And uh, it's been working great. It's, I've been, up, been on the grid for about seven months. We're saving lots of money, lots of carbo, carbo, uh, hydrocarbons in using the sun in this, uh, this farm that we created. So I want to commend him for that. It's a great program. Uh, I would have a question, though, for Congresswoman Estee with regard to why she would have voted no on House Bill 4899, which is entitled Lower, Lowering Gasoline Prices to Fuel an America That Works. So if she could take some time to discuss that, I'd be appreciative. All right. Do you wish to discuss it? I can't, I know there are many wonderful sounding bills in Congress, and a lot of them have provisions in them that are very wrong for our state. There you will not find a bill in Congress that doesn't have a lovely sounding title. You will not find that. But I do believe, and I, and I have to say, there, there is a vigorous disagreement within the U.S. House of Representatives, as there is in the country, about how much emphasis we place on hydrocarbons, which is to say on petroleum and on natural gas. And the mix that was in that bill was not one that I think is right for the state for exactly many of the reasons you just stated. We made a bold investment in the state and we are innovating and licensing technologies to the rest of the world. I think Connecticut's future is in innovation, it's in efficiency, and in developing the technologies that in fact the rest of the world wants and needs. And, and doubling down on our dependence on on gasoline is not wise for us as a state, frankly, for our own self-interest to say nothing of for the environment. Okay, Mr. Greenberg, is there anything further to add to that? You okay. can feel free to expand. Well, yeah, basically this bill had related to uh, drilling off the continental shelf, which if we would issue more permits and we would uh, drill in the, off the continental shelf, then we would be able to be that much closer to energy independence. I believe we have to be energy independent. I believe this is important for many reasons. The more energy that we could take out of the shelf, the more energy that we could take out of uh, the Bakken formation, and the new discovery in eastern Pennsylvania, the less reliant we'll be on the Middle East. And the less, uh, the less we would have to send our young people over to the Middle East to fight for those oil wells, which happened, as you know, on many occasions. So frankly, I'm for energy independence. I'm for the uh, Keystone Pipeline. We know, for instance, that the Trans Trans Alaska Pipeline has performed flawlessly without environmental impact. Why don't we build Keystone? We'll create jobs by building Keystone. Why don't we drill off the continental shelf? We'll create jobs by doing so. We'll increase our supply, thus reduce the cost to consumers as well, which reduces inflation. You know, this is a win-win-win. I would love to have a commitment by Congresswoman Esty for uh, an all-of-the-above energy policy. Nuclear, too. Why have we not built a nuclear plant in 40 years? I think we should look into this again. We have to become energy independent. Can I more on energy? Yes. Uh, yes, please. I, I think energy independence, much bandied about, is not actually the right concept. Oil is an international commodity. If we pump more of it, that will reduce the price over the whole world, not in America, over the whole world. So the real idea here is energy security. 
I'm part of a bipartisan group called No Labels. I'm on the energy working group in that, and we are working hard at what should that all of the above strategy look like. And it should be one about long-term moving us to energy security, which is not going to be doubling down on petroleum, because in fact, petroleum is essential for certain kinds of certain kinds of products we can only use oil for. So we need to be moving our transportation infrastructure onto a different sort of fuel. And that's going to make sense for us long term. Uh, so it's not as simple as uh, destroying the environment by drilling off the coast of Alaska. We, we can and we should preserve the environment, should be responsible about the enormous aquifer that the XL uh, pipeline would go over and be safe about all the farmlands that cross, be very smart and very careful about what we do. Absolutely, we should have all of the above, but it needs to be thoughtful, it needs to respect the environment, and we should not be rash and hasty just to create a bunch of jobs in the short term if in the long term we're harming our environment and we're endangering the planet with adding more hydrocarbons that we don't need to do. Okay, Mr. Greenberg, is there anything further? I, you're flipping through your notes. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I was going to say that I think we have methodologies now to preserve the environment and not harm the environment uh, in the process of achieving uh, ind independence. Um, all life comes to a choice. And if you can make the choice to do an all the above uh, energy policy and drill, and there's a 99.7% chance, a 99.8% chance that you're not going to harm the environment, but you're going to be helping 330 million people in this country, I think you perhaps make that decision to do that. So, again, my feeling is that we have to move toward energy independence. We have to be sensitive about the environment but let's look at the facts and, and, and try to move that way. Okay, um, Mr. Reiser, did you have a follow-up on that? 